We, we have just a, a few announcements. If you've got a bulletin with you this morning, well, first I would tell you that the bulletin note uh, sheet in the bulletin is applicable today. If you were here last week, you, you learned very quickly that uh, from my announcement, and if you didn't catch my announcement, you learned right away when Pastor Kevin started preaching and it didn't have anything to do with the note sheet that was in your bulletin, you learned right away that they didn't match up. Today is your lucky day. Because it matches up, okay? Uh, another thing that's in your bulletin is another one of those uh, bookmarks. I handed them out last week in the bulletin. They're in your bulletin again today. Uh, we are going to be putting these out throughout the next few months uh, to remind you, okay, and for you to remind others that the folks at Pasco Nazarene are taking a journey through um, today until September 2nd, uh, testing God. We've been in a sermon series uh, called Give, Grow, Multiply, okay, or Give, Multiply, Grow, there we go, Give, Multiply, Grow, and uh, we've been talking about giving over the past three uh, services. Uh, Pastor Kevin talked to us about trusting last week, and what a way uh, to segue into this as we begin to talk about multiplying today in faith. Uh, there's other announcements in that bulletin that are very good for you to know about. It's fishing trip. Lots of things going on in the life of the church. Make sure that you update your calendars. Make sure that you know what's going on. Those announcements are there in the bulletin to inform you. We removed the baby bottles uh, today because we're having communion. But they're out in the foyer. So remember that by Father's Day, uh, coming up here in just two more weeks, uh, we're going to be collecting those baby bottles filled with coins or checks or cash, cash works, any kind of money you want stuff in there would be great to help the Pregnancy Center for Tri-Cities, okay? And uh, so on we go. Uh, we've been talking about giving, right? And some of you have probably been saying, man, I sure hope Pastor stops talking about giving. Uh, he's been talking about it for three weeks in a row. We've had enough. We've had enough of this generosity stuff. And if he would just stop asking us to to trust God and give, well, I'm sorry, but we're going to keep on doing it. Uh, generosity works, and we're going to be moving into the, the multiply part of our sermon series today. And, and we're talking about faith. If, if anything grows when you give, it's your faith. I mean, if you give expecting that your bank account is going to grow, that might be a, a bad motivation for you to give. Because it may not necessarily work that way. You, you may receive a blessing and it may not be out of your bank account. Okay? It may not go right back in there. We, we shared several weeks ago a story about a, a lady who just gave a buck. Right? She had $5.35 in her checking account. She knew she needed to give. And so she gave a buck. And then later that week, a couple days down the road, uh, she had some bills that needed to be taken care of. But she trusted God and she didn't know how she was going to pay those bills with $4.35 in her account. And God blessed her with a check for a thousand bucks because she was obedient and out of what she had, she still gave. It can happen like that. I'm not going to tell you it doesn't, okay? But when we give, probably the most important thing that grows out of our giving and trusting God is our faith, okay? God can multiply a lot of things. He multiplies our offerings when we give them to him. He multiplies the money that's given and the time and the talents and all those things. That's great. But God grows faith when we test him. I, I really think it's kind of my personal opinion. This is one of those reasons why God says in this, this section of Scripture in Malachi chapter 3, the only place in Scripture where he says, just test me in this, is because he wants our faith to grow exponentially. And if we, who are so strictly tied to money and possessions, as we all are, when we give those away, and then he multiplies it, and we see the blessings, our faith grows. God just, just grows that little seed of faith in us. And before you know it, man, it is blossoming. And our faith shares testimonies about how God has been working. Uh, I have to keep telling you that I keep getting more stories about what's going on, and uh, how people have been already reaching out and, and testing God, even though today's the first Sunday of testing God journey, okay? People have been reaching out saying, okay, God, I'm going to go all in. I'm giving you the whole tithe. I'm not going to mess around with this anymore. And, and within hours, 24 hours, you know, just a day, man, things are happening. 
And I'd love to sit here and recount all these stories that I have already, but they're not mine to share. Okay? So over the next few weeks, we're going to be having some folks share. Okay? And if you have something, if God says, I need you to be obedient and, and I want you to trust me and you do, and God starts changing things in your life and, and stories start happening, okay, and you start seeing the multiplying and the, and the blessing, we're going to want you to share it, okay? Whether it's on Facebook or here in our worship service that we can celebrate together, we got stories and testimonies about how awesome God is already. And we're just starting the challenge today. So how many of you feel like, right now, I mean, just, just be honest, how many of you feel like you're settling in life? Just settling for what you got? Anybody? Okay. How many of you would say that at one point in your life you felt like you were just settling? Okay, for whatever you were going to get. Okay. Uh, maybe at one time you believed that God was going to do something magnificent in your life, but it hasn't happened yet, so you'll just settle for sitting here listening to me. <laughs> Which isn't anywhere close to God doing something magnificent in your life. Okay. That, that God was going to do something amazing in your life. You, you prayed for it. God told you maybe when you were a kid in church camp or, or Sunday school. Or, or maybe it was just a couple weeks ago. God said something amazing is going to happen. I just want you to wait and trust him. Okay? Uh, maybe you read the book a long time ago. It kind of made its way through the church. The Prayer of Jabez. Anybody read the Prayer of Jabez when it was popular? Okay. Prayer of Jabez says, Bless me, God. If you just bless me, enlarge my territory. Use me to make a difference. At one point, maybe you just had faith in the miracles of God. Okay, that this, this big thing was just going to happen. And maybe now you're willing to settle for a consolation prize. Maybe you started second-guessing yourself and saying, well, God at one point said he was going to do something amazing, but this is just not very amazing in my life. So maybe I'll just settle and I'll, I'll use something else. I'll do something else. And, and maybe now you're saying, God, just do something, do anything. So that I know that what you said at one point is actually true. So I stop asking you questions about it. Just do anything. I would say this message is for those of you who have lowered your expectations of what God can and will do in and through you. As we move from the portion of our series uh, of giving to multiply, I want to ingrain into your mind over the next several weeks one idea that can change your perspective and your viewpoint about how God does things, how God can multiply and God can grow what we give over to him. And this is it. You have no idea what God... You have no idea. <laughs> Poor Miranda's been sitting back there trying to get it to work for quite a while. It's not her fault. You have, okay, so I'm just going to say it. You have no idea what God may produce through a single seed planted in faith. Okay? You have no idea what kind of tree is going to grow out of that. You have no idea what God's going to do when he says, I believe in you. You have no idea what he's going to change in this world because of your faith in him. And when he plants a small seed of faith in you, and it grows out of your obedience, out of your trust in him. It grows into something incredible, okay? This week I want to talk about an Old Testament couple who had a, a seed of faith, a very small seed of faith that was exponentially multiplied by God. We're going to the Old Testament to talk about this couple by the name of Abraham and Sarah. We've talked about them in our, our journey through the, the story that we went through. I'm sure uh, most of you have heard, have heard sermons about Abraham and Sarah at one point or another in your life. But Abraham and Sarah, you know, this couple, they've been married. Uh, they have wanted a family. We'll just say that. I, I think I can assume that out of Scripture, that they would love to have a family. They haven't been able to have a family. Sarah's barren. Okay, They wanted a baby. They couldn't conceive. And when you want something and you can't get it, it seems like everyone else has it. Does it not? 
I'll tell you what. If you want to get pregnant, you're a married couple, you want to get pregnant, you want kids, you want to start a family, and it's just not working, it seems like everyone in the church is having two, three, four, five kids. All your coworkers at work are getting pregnant, okay? It's like it's not working for you, but everybody else in the world is having, you know, twins and triplets. And, and you just want to say, God, I don't get it. I think this is kind of where maybe Abraham and Sarah were. Out of nowhere, God comes with a huge challenge of their faith. Out of nowhere. It's way back in the beginning of Genesis. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 says this. The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. So you got Abraham and Sarah. They don't got any kids. Okay? They're living in modern-day Iraq. Okay? And God says, pick up your stuff and your family and go to a place that I'm going to tell you about later. Now, some of us OCD people would say, how am I supposed to go if you don't tell me where I'm supposed to go? Where's point B? You know, I, I, in order to get to point C, you got every other letter in between. And I'm at A, so how do I get there? Just go. Have some faith. Walk down the road, okay? So Abraham and Sarah pick up their family. They start heading down the road. And God says to them, I will make you, in verse 2, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. Making into a great nation? They didn't even have kids. How are we supposed to be a great nation? But God says, I believe in you. Something amazing is going to happen in you. Go. So they pick up and they go. I'll make you a great nation. God says later, you'll be the father of many nations. And God says, if God says he will do it, hot diggity, that means kids and grandkids and great grandkids, you know what I'm saying? If God says he's going to do it in Scripture, we believe he's going to do it. He hasn't let us down yet. Amen? When God promises you something, you don't have to settle for a consolation prize because it will happen. Now, I can guarantee 99.9% .9 certainty it's not going to happen in the timing that you want it to happen. But God will make it happen. You don't have to settle. Okay? So, uh, I bet as they're going down the road, they're figuring out, hey, God said we're going to be made into a great nation. And told Abraham, we're going to be the father of many nations. Hey, Sarah, that means we're going to have kids. Can you just picture it? So they're probably, hey, you know, we're going to pick out names. If it's a boy, it'll be this. If it's a girl, it'll be this. You know what I'm talking about? Some of you did this when you got pregnant and you were going to have kids, right? You go down the journey. Maybe Sarah's going down the road and she's reading what to expect when you're expecting. <laughs> you know, Abraham's over there. He's got all these big ideas of what the nursery's going to be when the, when the boy gets born. You know, it's going to be Star Wars all over the walls and the Mariners and the Seahawks and all that stuff. Come on! <laughs> No. <laughs> Sarah's probably thinking it's going to be a Noah's Ark theme. Because it just happened, right? Noah's Ark, right before that in Genesis. Why do you guys need to wake up this morning? <laughs> they are planning to have the best baby gender reveal the world has ever seen. Okay? Can you imagine the hopes that they have? I'm going to make you into a great nation. I'm going to make you a father of many nations. You're going to have kids. It's already late in their life, but I just, they're going to have some kids. So months go by, nothing. Okay? Uh, another month, nothing. God promised so it's going to happen. And, and by now, months have gone by, months have gone by, and nothing's happening. Sarah's not pregnant. It's not getting any better. It's not looking any better. And so maybe, maybe they begin to say, this ain't working. God said, but maybe not. It's just not happening. God, in Genesis 12, God promised, and then we jump to Genesis 15, and we find the next part of our story. In Genesis 15, it says, Some time later, the Lord spoke to Abram in a vision and said to him, Do not be afraid. 
for I will protect you and your reward will be great. But Abraham replied to him. Let, let's just, you know, you're going to hear it in a second, but we know what's on Abraham's mind. <coughs> Okay. Abraham replied to him, O sovereign Lord, what good are all your blessings when I don't even have a son? <coughs> Abraham and Sarah have been talking about kids all along the journey. And God says, don't be afraid in this journey. And Abraham just sticks it right to him. God, you promised this. It's been months and months and months. Nothing has ever happened. Okay, What good are all your blessings if I'm not getting what you promised? You said I was going to be a father of nations, and I don't even have a son. From Abram's point of view, nothing is happening. Any of you ever feel like that sometimes? God's told you something's going to happen, and nothing happened? Am I the only one that ever feels like that? I'll tell you what, now pray for stuff. It's just not happening, you know? You don't get a yes because the Ferrari doesn't magically show up in your driveway. And you don't get a no. I mean, there's no like, hey, Ryan, that ain't going to happen. Okay? You, you not get a clear answer, so it seems like nothing's happening. And, and you just say, you know, God, nothing's happening. I, I don't get it. Uh, Genesis chapter 12, Father of nations, many nations, blessed. Genesis 15, some time later, at least a decade has passed. A decade, ten years of waiting on God's promise. A decade or more, and from Abraham and Sarah's perspective, there is no evidence of God working on that promise he made. But instead, there's a whole lot of unfulfilled promises and a whole lot of unrealized expectations. Every month, nope, not pregnant. Every month, disappointment. Ten years, 120 months of no answer. And at Abraham and Sarah's age, the door is slamming shut in their eyes. So even Abraham himself lowers his expectations from father of nations to this verse in Genesis 15. How about one son, God? You said I would be the father of nations. Can we just start with one? Can I just lower my expectations a little bit? Because it doesn't seem like you're working on it. It's been 10 years. How about we just start with one, God? You have cry out to God like that? With that anger and that frustration? God, you promised something. Some big's going to happen in my life. How about just a little something? How about you just do something, anything? Where are you, God? Why are you not doing what you said you would do? Some of you have your own version of this story, don't you? Maybe you said, I got to get out of debt. I'm going to pay off my credit card bills by next year. And in the midst of trying to do all the get out of debt stuff, you know, the car breaks down, or something happens, a doctor's visit. And instead of the debt getting paid, it doubles. And the interest is racking up. And you say, where are you, God? I made this promise to you I was going to get out of debt. I was going to work so hard and make an extra payment. And all this has happened instead. Maybe you've been praying for a long time for a parent or a sibling or a best friend. That they would just hear one little message from God. That Jesus would touch their life and transform their life. Maybe... You've been praying like me for a sibling. I've been praying for my brother for 25 years. That he would just hear a message about Jesus. His best friend from elementary school till now is a preacher in the Lutheran church. Still doesn't listen to him. His brother, preacher in the Nazarene church. I don't need God. Why do I need God? I keep on praying and I keep on hoping. And I will pray without ceasing. Until there's no more air in my lungs to pray. Out of the hope that God would soften his heart. Maybe, maybe you've been praying for a family member or a, a co-worker. And, and instead of things getting better, those family relations go south. You know, your co-worker that you love so much once becomes your greatest antagonist. And you feel like, I'm just praying good things on them. And the relationship stinks. 
Where are you, God? Maybe you said to yourself at one point, by this time, next year, I will have a spouse. It will be the spouse of my dreams. Prince Charming will become riding on the white charger. You know, some of you girls have been praying princess prayers for a long time. And you keep extending the date. Because God doesn't bring Prince Charming on the white charger. It, you know, there's some other guys and, and you feel like maybe I should just settle. Or maybe not. Where, where are you, God? Maybe you've just been feeling like you're so healthy and you're thanking God for the blessing. Man, I haven't had any serious illnesses in, in ever, okay? And then you go for that one checkup and you got cancer. Or like my father-in-law, you got ALS. And you say, where are you, God? You promised great things for me. But where are you now? You start asking God some serious questions. Did you, for, did you forget about me yet? Did you forget about the promise that you gave me so many years ago? Did I not hear you right when you told me this, God? Did I misunderstand in some way? Are you even there, God? There are points in my life where I've been screaming out to God, feeling like he's not even there. He's not even here. There's no response. Zero, zilch, none. From Abraham's point of view, nothing is happening. A decade after the promise of father of nations and still not even a son. For most of us, we lose sight of or we never had an idea of what God could do through a single seed planted in faith. If we would have faith and trust in our great God. If you ever felt this way, like God promised you something and you're waiting and you, you start lowering your expectations just so you can get anything out of the deal. This message, maybe it's for you today. For all of us in one way or another. Today we're talking about multiply when it comes to life, faith, God's blessings. Here's a, the first fill-in on your notes. It is this, we tend to think of addition in things of this life. We tend to think about adding things. And God thinks about multiplication. We think of things in the addition way. God thinks of things in a multiplication way. Abraham wanted to add a son. God says, no, 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 no. It's going to be so much bigger than that. A multiplied family. All the way back into the garden, God said, be fruitful and multiply. He didn't say be fruitful and add. Be fruitful and multiply. I think this way of thinking, when we think addition and God thinks multiplication, we think things too simply. Okay? We want to just add one thing and God says, no, I'm going to do so much more. Hang on. In Matthew chapter 13, starting at verse 3 and going to 9, it says this. Matthew 13. A, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop 160 and 30 times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. We have no idea what God can do through a single seed of faith in our life. A return of 30, 60, 100 times. That's what God wants to do. Abraham and Sarah, they want a son. Decade passes. Don't see a thing. Maybe we're like that too. We've been praying and we just don't see anything happening. Some of you have been saying, I I've been praying for a week, Pastor. Nothing's happened. Well, you're not praying long enough. God's not a cosmic Coke machine. We've talked about that before. 
where you put the prayer in and you get what you ask for. Sometimes God says, it's not the right timing. And when the timing becomes right, I'll blow your socks off. It will be so much bigger and better than what you ever thought. Okay? You've been believing and you've been praying that God would do, that God would change someone, that God would bring a miracle, that God would move upon, upon someone, and, and nothing is happening that you can see. I've been praying for my brother, like I said, for 25 years, and I haven't seen him budge an inch. But I'm never going to stop praying. Because one day, I expect a harvest. One day I expect, he, he knows, he gets told all the time. He sees the miracles in my life, in my family's life, in his best friend, in his family's life. He sees it, he knows it, he just not willing to accept it right now. But one day I pray that he'll get there. He'll see it, his eyes will be opened. And I know that day the harvest will be multiplied. It won't just be him. I have had these times when you're praying and you're praying and you're praying and it doesn't seem like anything has happened. Tunisia and I, we've talked about it before, Tunisia and I prayed for kids. And we lost three kids before we ever got to hold one. It seemed like it was counterproductive that we would pray for kids and, and it seemed almost like some cosmic joke that we would get pregnant, we, Tunisia, and then you have the ultrasounds, and you hear the heartbeats, and you see that little being, that little boy or girl, and then, nope. And, and then the second time, here it happens again, and nope. I tell you what, I was getting angry at God. But that had nothing to do with God. We live in this fallen world. We live in this ugly place called Earth. Okay? And it wasn't God not answering our prayer. Tunisia wasn't having a problem getting pregnant. Her body didn't want to be pregnant. We found that out once we had Michaela. Well, you have this thing called health syndrome happening. Your body does not like being pregnant. Instead, in fact, when you get pregnant, your whole body attacks itself and the fetus. And you end up trying to die. Oh, I get that now. It wasn't God. What we got out of the deal when we just kept praying and we kept praying was a daughter and a son who bless us so much. Our, our prayers weren't just answered. They were multiplied. The harvest is great. I, I look at my brother. I look at the goals in my life. I have prayed for lots of things. Sometimes selfishly. Sometimes just totally expecting God was going to do that awesome, miraculous thing. And sometimes he does, and sometimes he doesn't. But I need you to hear this today. Just because you don't see anything doesn't mean that God isn't doing anything. Just because you can't see or touch with your own eyes doesn't mean that God isn't answering your prayer. It doesn't mean that God isn't at work. We don't know what God is going to do with a single seed planted in faith in us. He's going to do miraculous things. I want you to think for a minute about the Gideon story, about the Gideon society that places Bibles all over this world. They've been doing this for 93 years now, Gideon society. Uh, men and women, just like you guys, just like me. They travel all over the world. They speak at churches. They raise money so that free Bibles can be put all over the place. They put them in hotels, motels, college campuses, hospitals, jails, public places, even schools. They do this like the sower of seeds in Jesus' parable. They don't know who will pick it up, what ground it will fall on, this Bible placed by the Gideons. But oh, the stories of people who have picked up a Gideon Bible. On average, Gideon's hand out or place two Bibles per second each year. In 2015, they reached the two billion Bible mark. 
They placed two billion Bibles in places of this world. It took them 93 years to get from zero to one billion Bibles, and it took them 14 to get from one billion to two billion. God's multiplying their ability to put out his word. God's blessing their ability to, to place Bibles. In 2018, they will distribute over 63 million Bibles. Free of charge. Sowing the seed. And asking God to multiply the harvest. And I will tell you, nine or more out of those out of ten Bibles, they can't tell you if anybody ever picked it up or learned anything about God or even accept, ask, ask Jesus to come into their life, but they keep on sowing the seed of the gospel. God has given them a call, and they do it. And the harvest has been great. I've heard many stories about people who picked up a Gideon Bible in a hotel or a jail cell or a school as they stand on a college campus and hand out New Testaments. A Gideon, we have no idea what God is going to do through a seed planted in faith. We have no idea what the harvest is going to be out of that. Our faith is like seed in the ground. That's our faith. Think about it that way. The seed has been planted in us, the seed of the gospel. If you don't see anything yet, it doesn't mean nothing's happening. There's a lot of stuff that happens under the ground before that seed pops up into something. See, I prayed and I prayed for this. Nothing's happened, but you need to know that something is happening. God's working on a little seed. We don't have insta seed yet. I bet people like Kenny would love to have insta seed back in the day, where they just put the seeds out and the next day they go and harvest. Well, you can make a good return. Of course, then the market's flooded with all of the thing that you just grew because it grows like that. You know. It'd be nice if we had insta-seed or insta-prayers. Just answer just like that, man. We don't have that yet. It takes rain. It takes sun. It takes nutrients in the soil. The roots have to start forming. It takes time. Before we see fruit, God is growing roots. You need to understand that in your own life. Before you see fruit, the fruit of the gospel in your own life, God is growing roots in you. You're learning. You're growing. Your roots are becoming stronger in the foundation of the Word and in the fellowship of Christ. If you don't see anything yet, just wait. God is growing in you. Abraham had the same problem that we have. And that is this. We have a limited perspective. We don't know what God's doing. We don't have all the information. I don't know what any of you are doing. I have a very limited perspective. In a tent, Abraham's sitting in a tent in Genesis 15. He's crying out to God, God, this would be great. You said I was going to be, uh, we were going to be made many nations, blessed by you. I was going to be the father of nations. How about a son? Could you just give me a son? He's in his tent praying. Telling God what he doesn't see. Okay? If you want to if you want to see a smile on God's face, go into a room, turn out all the lights, start praying and telling him all the things you can't see. And let him open your eyes to what you can't see. Abraham's in the tent. He says, I don't see you working, God. I don't see anything happening. I am not the father of many nations. I don't even have a son. Not, here, not married yet, don't have prospects. Marriage is still on the rocks. You've been praying for your relationship with your spouse, and the spouse hasn't changed yet, or you haven't changed yet. You're buried in debt. You don't see how to get out. Nothing's happening. The doctor report came back. It's not good. We don't see God anywhere. God, you're not doing what I wanted, what I needed. And I want you to know if, if God met all your expectations, He'd never have a chance to exceed them. If God answered every prayer that you ever prayed, 
Wouldn't, wouldn't it cheapen the grace that he's bestowed upon us? Wouldn't our relationship with him be different? He would be a cosmic Coke machine. If he answered every prayer in the affirmative of what we have asked for. So let's get back to our text, Genesis 15. Starting at verse 5, it says, uh, Abraham is in the tent. He's got limited perspective. He's telling God what he doesn't see. And Genesis chapter 15, verse 5 says, Then the Lord took Abraham outside. Simple thing. Maybe come with me. Go outside. The Lord meets Abraham in his limited context. And he takes him outside. Part of what I hope to do as your pastor, as a counselor, is to take you outside. To outside of your limited perspective. Outside of yourself sometimes. Because we all need help in doing that. Context, perspective, unmet expectations. We all have a limited perspective. And sometimes we just need God to take us outside. Your thoughts are not God's thoughts. Your ways are not God's ways. As high as the heavens are above the earth, God's ways are higher than ours. Amen? Amen. We don't know what God is doing. And that's probably a good thing. Then the Lord took Abraham outside and said to him, Look up into the, into the sky and count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. Abraham's telling God, how about we just start with a son? God takes him outside. Has him look up into the night sky and says, count the stars if you can. You want one. I want billions upon billions. Abraham says, God, you haven't even given me a son yet. And God takes him outside. And Abraham, looking up at those stars, stunned, shaken, silenced. Abraham thinking of adding a son to a family, and God is thinking of adding nations to the world. Abraham was thinking addition, and God is thinking multiplication. And the big idea, blow your socks off moment for this morning, is this, folks. You are one of those stars. When God took Abraham outside of his own limited perspective, and he took him out on that night, out of his tent, while he was having a prayer time with him, when God took him out and said, look up at the sky, and count them if you can, that's going to be your descendants. We, we are one of those stars, folks. We're one of the numbers. Grew up maybe in Sunday school class singing, Father Abraham, and then he and then his son said, Father Abraham, I am one of them, so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Right arm, left arm, right leg, left. Okay, so Abraham ends up, God's promise is fulfilled, right? Abraham becomes the father of nations, billions upon billions of people. And not just Christian people, Muslim people. If you belong to Christ, you are one of the stars that God was talking about in Genesis chapter 15. We would say that was at the beginning of time. Okay? So many years ago. A seed from the family tree of Abraham. We look at this and we look at Galatians chapter 3. Paul writing to the church there says, So in Christ. Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That's good news right there, folks. Galatians chapter 3, verse 29. You've got to underline that. It says, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. 
As if we all know what the promise is. I do. That Abraham would be the father of nations. That would change this world. That through Abraham's nations, God would be made known. God made a promise to Abraham in Genesis 12. Abraham has this limited perspective about that promise. Abraham was thinking of a son. There's another fill-in in your notes. Abraham was thinking of a son, but God was thinking of you. Abraham, like so many of us, was looking at the instant gratification part of the promise. Just give me a son. Can we just start with something? Abraham was settling for the collateral price, the, this, this prize over here that really didn't mean a lot. Now, for those of you who know that story, we know that Abraham and Sarah got so tired of waiting that they decided to try to get this going on their own, right? So Sarah hands over her servant to Abraham and says, have a son. He has a son with her, an illegitimate son. God says, that's not my son. That's not, not the promise I promised you. They were settling. But God said, out of your son, out of you, will be many nations. Don't settle for what you think is okay right now. Put your faith in God. So what does this have to do with generosity, our, our series of give, multiply, grow? Uh, out of God's generous grace, this faith that Abraham had multiplied because of God. You say, I don't have very much to tithe, or I don't have very much to give. I don't have a lot of possessions. Uh, or maybe you say, I don't have a lot of possessions I can afford to give. Okay? But God says, test me in this. And see if I don't throw open the floodgates of heaven. See if God doesn't multiply what you give out of faith. Never measure God's unlimited power and resources by your limited expectations. You need to hear that again. Never measure God's unlimited power and resources by your limited expectations. God is able to do vastly more than we could ever imagine or even ask for. We have no idea what God can produce through a single seed of faith planted in a guy like Abraham or in somebody like us. One Bible seed, two billion and counting with three Bibles the Gideon Society puts out. One prayer prayed, a life saved, and then the effects of countless lives around it. See, I'm not just praying for my brother. I'm praying for my brother so that through him, his wife, his kids, his grandkids, and on down the line, I'm praying for a much bigger harvest because I trust God with that big harvest. It would be great if I could just get my brother to understand who Jesus is in his life. But Folks, that's not the end story. I'm looking for multiplication here. One gift given, one seed sown, and a harvest multiplied by God's economy. Just because we don't see God working doesn't mean God's not doing something. Amen? God is alive and well. And He is working well. And I'll say it again, never... Never measure God's unlimited power and resources based on your limited expectations. With that in mind, I would like us to have a time of remembering what Jesus has done for us. You know, if God did what we expected him to do, he never would have sent his son to die for us. Because we never would have said, oh man, somebody would give up their son for all of humanity? God? We would have a God like that? Our limits and expectations would, would never say that. But God says, I have limited power and resources, and I'm going to give the one thing that means the most, that shows you my love, my son. <laughs>